going to do something a little bit different. Normally I take a small subject, uh, talk about it for about 10 or 15 minutes, but in these pandemic times, obviously uh, sometimes we're required to do just a little bit more and today is one of those days. Article 10, uh, what we're gonna talk about today is fair housing, particularly as it applies to Article 10. Um, article 10 is the article uh, that requires that you uh, avoid discrimination. And I'm going to read it to you so that you have a basis. And then I'm going to go over a very, very significant change uh, that um, can really cause you a lot of trouble uh, if you uh, run afoul of the new rule. Article 10 provides as follows. Realtors shall not deny equal professional services to any person for reasons of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. This is an important part. Realtors shall not be parties to any plan or agreement to discriminate against a person or persons on the basis of the same categories, race, uh, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Goes on to say realtors in their real estate employment practices shall not discriminate against any person based on those categories. Now keep in mind, this is a NAR rule. These are nine categories that NAR um, has included in the code of ethics. In California, as I'll talk about later, we actually have 22 categories of protected classes and the legislature does uh, additions to that group on a regular basis. They've added a couple in the last couple of years. So what happened? Well, let me give you a little bit of historic content. Um, all of us have been watching the news. This has been a very uh, interesting year for want of a better term. Uh, we've had a very divisive uh, presidential election. We've had uh, lots of uh, uh, arguments and in some cases even riots. We've had a lot of stuff this last year. Peaceful protests, some protests that weren't so peaceful. Obviously, the pandemic has created all kinds of issues, um, and, and not the least of which has been the, the demands for social justice, the demands for equal treatment of persons of color, uh, primarily in terms of what's been in the news, but also gay rights, uh, 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 feminist rights, and, and so forth. So it's been a very, very busy year. Um, and, and housing, which is obviously an incredibly important part of, of uh, the American dream, uh, has not escaped that scrutiny. Now, uh, historically, it's been established and there are some excellent books out there uh, that um, in, in a lot of ways, NAR and the federal government have been complicit in, in, in a lot of the discrimination that has led us to this point. Uh, redlining of areas, uh, lending, uh, uh, requirements and so forth and so on. So, so what we have essentially is a, a, a lot of uh, uh, issues relating to fair housing, uh, issues relating to the ability of a person of color or an eth of an ethnicity to get equal treatment uh, in, in housing. Um, last year, uh, uh, a, a situation came up in um, uh, Long Island, New York, where uh, Newsday Magazine uh, did a, uh, a, a study, uh, a survey, an expose, whatever you want to call it. They sent out uh, a trained and then sent out a group of testers. And there were African-Americans, there were Hispanics, and there were Asians. And they went out and, and to, to uh, uh, portray themselves as potential buyers and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of negativity was discovered. In about 49% of the cases, the African-American prospective purchasers slash testers were discriminated against, steering to areas, uh, refusal to provide equal services, flat out lying about the availability of property, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the number was a little bit less 
about 40% for Hispanics and, and uh, a little bit less for Asians, but far above any problems that uh, Caucasians were having. Additionally, there were some uh, studies done relative to appraisals where uh, it became pretty clear that um, properties that uh, were being appraised in some cases by appraisers uh, were being given different numbers uh, depending upon uh, the color of uh, skin. In one particular case, um, the uh, appraisers were asked to go out and appraise. Uh, there were uh, photographs of the family. Um, it was an African-American family, pictures of, of uh, the children, pictures of the owners, so forth and so on. That same house was then evaluated by an appraiser uh, at a later time with all of the pictures taken down and a white family replaced and the number was substantially higher. And so those kinds of things uh, uh, have been real problems. And then of course, because of the high pitch nature of, uh, of, of some of the public discussions, there's, there's been a lot of emotion going back and forth. And so people have said some things on social media that were downright hateful, frankly. Um, and as a result, um, NAR felt that it was time to act. And they've been incredibly aggressive and, and in a positive way. Uh, they've hired uh, some tremendous people. Uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Green is now heading up uh, an entire department at NAR. They have a website dedicated to fair housing issues. They've come up with some really great videos. But the decision of the professional, the National Professional Standards people with staff input was that, that NAR needed to do something about hate speech and, 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 and so forth. And so um, at a meeting on November the 13th, the National Association of Realtors Board of Directors voted to make some significant changes to NAR policy. And you need to understand what was done because it could affect um, your, your license and uh, your pocketbook. So um, what are the changes? Well, there's basically three general over, overall changes. The first one, which is incredibly significant, is that they made the decision that um, the code of ethics uh, in, in areas relating to um, race and, and a number of other areas re relating to fraud um, are applicable, not just in your real estate transactions, but in all of your, <clears throat> excuse me, all of your activities. So that's very, very important because it affects all forms of discrimination and, and, and expands the reach of professional standards relative to the applicability of the code of ethics on much more behavior uh, on the theory that realtors are not just realtors during business hours, but are realtors through their lives. They reflect the industry, they reflect the professionalism of the industry and so forth. Uh, the second change that they made, um, which I'm going to read to you, was a change to the sanctioning guidelines. Um, the sanctioning guidelines are guidelines that are used by professional standards when someone is accused of a uh, wrongful act and are found guilty to punish them. It can be as little as a letter of warning all the way to expulsion uh, from the board and in some cases the MLS. Um, in, in three areas, if a, if a realtor is found guilty of stealing from a client, uh, lying uh, to a client, or in discriminating uh, in the manner I just described, that's considered a violation of the public trust and, re and those violations are required to be reported to the governing body uh, that handles licensing for that given state. In California, obviously that is the Department of Real Estate. And, and so what, what they now say is that public trust is used in this context uh, a, a demonst is, is to demonstrate misappropriation of, or, or, of customer funds or property or discrimination against the protected uh, classes under the code of ethics. So if in fact you uh, discriminate or steal, uh, you will be, and it doesn't matter the amount, uh, if, if you misappropriate money, it could be very, very important for property managers, for example. If you misappropriate money or you discriminate, uh, it's going to be reported to the Department of Real Estate. 
Now they tweak that during the debate um, because uh, 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 at least in California and in most states, the governing body is limited to enforcement of real estate violations. And I talked to uh, uh, the, the chief investigator here in uh, Southern California and he indicated that that was the case in California. So we're not, they're not gonna report non real estate related activities in terms of your license, but they, they could report you to the Department of Fair Housing or other governmental bodies. The bottom line being, you're in some real big trouble. You're facing a $15,000 fine. You're facing suspension. You may be required to take numerous classes and conceivably if it does affect real, and again, it's not just a transaction where I refuse to show you a house. It could be in any real estate related transaction or it could be part of a scheme or a scam to keep an area white or to keep an area free of certain of, uh, of the groups. Uh, if you're part of that either directly or implicitly, it could be something reported to the Department of Real Estate. And then the third thing they did, which is the one that seems to be creating the most controversy is they changed one of the standards of practice. Whenever you're accused of a violation of the code of ethics, it's the articles. There are 17 of them. Hopefully periodically you will read them. The association posts those, um, those uh, articles on the association's website. You can download them, you should train on them, you should know them. Um, and then there are standards of practice which flesh out what that means. For example, in article one, it talks about uh, treating your client uh, in a fiduciary manner, putting their interests before your own. And then it goes on in 26 or different categories to indicate how you do that. You know, you, you're objectively showing uh, every offer that comes in, you're disclosing how you pay uh, uh, fees and all of that. Article 10 has those kinds of standards of practice. They have changed 10.5 and I'm going to read that to you because this has been very controversial. Realtors must not use harassing speech, hate speech, epitaphs, or slurs based on race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or uh, uh, sexual identity. Again, these are national standards. Uh, uh, these don't necessarily impact the, the protected categories in California. So that, first of all, uh, let's go over a couple of things. Number one, it is not retroactive. This, this new rule went into effect on November the 13th. It's not, we're not waiting for January the 1st, which is what they usually do. It went into effect immediately, but it's not retroactive. So anything that you say, anything that you write, anything that you place on, on, on your social media, it, it, any, it could even be in some circumstances where you merely like something someone else said, or you make a comment in support of some hate speech slur or something like that. So that became effective on January the 1st, excuse me, on, on November the 13th, not January the 1st. So let me give you the definitions of, of these things. So what is hate speech? Well, uh, it, they cited specifically to Webster's Dictionary, which says it is speech, uh, and again, it can be verbal or it can be in writing. It is speech that is intended to insult, offend, or intimidate a person because of some trait such as race, religion, sexual orientation. So if you were to take that in the context of this, just include such as the traits for those nine categories. And it's intended to insult, offend, or intimidate. Epitaphs are, uh, it's a characterization uh, of a word or a phrase that, is, that accompanies or occurs in place of the name of the person. So instead of calling uh, Mary Smith, Mary Smith, you call her that something, or you refer to the person's race, or you refer to something along those lines, uh, or it could be a disparaging or abusive word or phrase. And then a slur is an insulting or disparaging remark or innuendo. It is basically what, what the Webster refers to as a shaming or degrading effect. It is a stain 
or a stigma. So um, again, that's what hate speech is. Um, I know there are those of you out there that are, that are going to watch this uh, recording that say, well, wait a minute. What about my First Amendment rights, my, my rights to free speech? Not an issue. Why? Because free speech um, is, is something reflected on the government. Under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, it says that Congress shall pass no law infringing upon freedom of speech, religion, and association. That was extended to the states and local governments under uh, the 14th Amendment. So basically any governmental entity uh, cannot impinge on speech, on religion, on association. And of course, under this pandemic, you've all been reading about lawsuits that have been filed by churches. You've been reading about lawsuits filed by groups who are not allowed to meet, those kinds of things. And so there's a lot of conflict going on right now, but in the context of government's actions, NAR, CAR, and the associations are not government agencies. They are trade organizations. And as such, they can uh, eliminate certain types of speech. And you've heard the phrase, we don't talk like that around here. Well, this is what we're talking about. So um, how's it gonna be enforced? Well, we're gonna be doing some training for both professional standards and grievance. And we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna be doing that fairly soon because uh, it's conceivable that somebody could file one of these complaints any day now, and it's gonna go to grievance. And so we're gonna do some training. If in fact um, uh, you're found guilty, uh, then the sanctions will be in accordance with what NAR allows. The panel could decide that you didn't do it on purpose, that you were uh, inadvertent, you could get a letter of warning or a letter of reprimand. You could be fined. You could um, uh, be suspended from membership. You could be suspended from, uh, uh, or excuse me, expelled. Um, if, it's, if it's something to do uh, with the MLS, you could have your MLS privileges uh, uh, also interrupted. Uh, but the most important thing that will happen is if the panel determines that you did this with the level of intent laid out, um, then you are going to be reported uh, to the Department of Real Estate. Um, so we're going to get that training done uh, uh, pretty quickly. A uh, couple of, there's a lot of controversy about this and I don't, uh, I would take a full day to, to go over some of the issues. You know, questions have, have arisen about, um, like I said, what if I merely like something? What if I, does this affect my ability to agree or disagree politically. In other words, am I shut down? No, but you gotta be careful. And you should be careful, frankly, that, it, that you don't make it personal, that it's not about prejudice. You may disagree with, with some provision of the law that, or you may disagree with some proposal to change the law and, and you have every right to politically disagree um, so long as you don't engage in hate speech. There's a right way to say things and a wrong way. We've all seen what's been happening politically over the last uh, couple of years. It hasn't been very pretty. We are going to be looking at issues of freedom of religion because there are some areas where religion has butted up against um, uh, some of the protected categories in some very significant ways. Um, it, not everything that you do is going to be what we're, what we're looking at, it has to be something tied to the code of ethics. Um, so again, you do have a right to uh, uh, your opinion, but again, because this is a very, very subjective, um, one of the things that um, I'm gonna be charged with and that Lori Smith, who is your professional standards manager is going to be charged with is we are really going to need to um, Take a, take a good hard look at how we, we are consistent, how these things don't become vigilante kinds of actions uh, where I just don't like you, so I'm gonna make up something um, and so forth. Um, brokers, you need to be extra careful because under California law and under CAR policy, you have a duty to supervise. And so if your agents are engaging in hateful conduct, 
um, under uh, uh, the Department of Real Estate's Regulation 2725F, you have a duty to train your agents on discrimination issues under both federal and state law. So um, you, you need to be extremely careful um, and you need to understand uh, that you have some responsibility. Um, this will apply to sexual harassment because that, again, one of the protected categories is sex. So if you sexually harass somebody, um, either in social media directly or through some type of correspondence, that could be an Article 10 violation um, and it will now be much uh, uh, e easier uh, to bring that charge because of the specific uh, nature of 10.5. My best advice that I can, and again, there's some other issues regarding schools, regarding location issues, regarding steering, all of those issues are gonna be uh, uh, critically important. So you're gonna need to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Um, I, I guess the, the, the best thing I can tell you is you need to educate yourself. Um, we all grew up in different times. We all grew up in different places. We were all uh, given you know, uh, training by our parents, by our peers, and, and frankly, uh, there are uh, sometimes issues where you don't even realize that you have this um, this deep-seated uh, bias that that is not necessarily uh, uh, at the surface. So I would hope that you would get some training at the minimum. Understand that um, it, it, again. It's okay to disagree. It's it's okay to negotiate. It's okay to do all those things. It's perfectly acceptable. It's part of your job. But if what you're doing is based upon the characteristic of a person, the color of their skin, the, the, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, if that's the issue, it has nothing to do with price, terms, the things that realtors should be zeroing in on, you can get yourself in some significant trouble. There's a couple of particular areas here in California uh, that are a little bit unique uh, to us that may not necessarily be uh, a, a, a Article 10 violation, but that you need to be careful of. One of those is the so-called love letters. These are the letters that a buyer will write uh, to a seller, so many times going through uh, the real estate uh, professional, either handing it over to the buyer uh, agent to give to the, the listing agent or and somehow uh, dealing with that. Number one, you need to be very careful of that. Photographs, certain kinds of comments that are made in these letters. I know NAR and CAR have both warned, as have, as have Lori and I, that you need to be extra special careful about those love letters. Um, obviously, the safest thing to do is to sit down with your seller and then to put in the MLS that the seller is not going to accept those kinds of letters. But in the event that your seller does want to see them, then you need to make it extra clear to the seller that those letters are letters that need to be uh, absolutely race neutral, absolutely gender neutral, absolutely neutral that they, it's basically about the house, about the location, but even that has gotten some agents in trouble. So we're going to do some, some discussion with professional standards about how we're going to enforce uh, uh, these kinds of issues. But my best advice to you is go onto the CAR site. They have a quick guide, which is excellent on the, the so-called buyer letters or love letters. It's actually called buyer interest letters accompanying offers, legal risks and potential for unconscious or implicit bias. It's a quick guide. Um, it's on their risk management area and, and it really is very good. There's also a seminar that was done on the topic and you can click on, watch that seminar and then uh, obtain the, the written documents that came from that. Um, you also need to be very conscious about the fact that in California, on January the 1st of this year of 2020, the Department of Fair Housing adopted 50 pages of new fair housing regulations that um, in, in many cases mirror what NAR did, um, but make it very, very clear that um, uh, in, in rental of, of property and in sale of property, fair housing issues are very, very important. Again, remembering that we have 22 categories as opposed to nine. So uh, uh, these are really significant issues. Um, 
CAR on October the 1st uh, started packaging, bundling, or whatever the term you'd like to use uh, with all of your um, uh, paperwork, uh, a fair housing advisory. And, and it, it would behoove you uh, to read that advisory. It's got some great information in it, uh, some great practice tips uh, on a couple of things about that fair housing advisory. Um, uh, number one, uh, you should read it. It's a good, quick introduction to the fair housing laws. Um, and then you pay particular attention to the protected categories in California. Uh, also learn the protected categories under Article 10, most of which are included in California. Um, make sure you understand that the purpose is to protect people so that basically it doesn't matter what color I am, what my sexual orientation is, what my religion might be, I'm entitled to buy a house in an area that I want. And then I wanna finish with some really good best practices. Uh, the selection and location of a neighborhood, property features, range and all that, those need to come directly from the buyer, not that you steer them to something. Um, you need to be very, very consistent, provide the same information, the same objectivity to everyone. No one is to be treated differently. That's what happened in Long Island. That's what got those people into a lot of trouble. Be courteous to everybody. Be professional to everybody. It isn't about the color of my skin or my, my accent or anything else. It has to do, hey, I qualify for, for, for X amount of dollars. I got a good score and I want to live where, where I can raise my family the best. Again, be very careful about your advertising and the things you say which could imply a fair housing issue. Um, be very careful about uh, the kind of information you provide. Again, the best advice I can give you is just be consistent. Same information on rentals, same information on, on sales to everybody. And then where necessary, because it does include disability, understand uh, the nature of reasonable accommodation. Um, so again, this is a tough top topic. We just found out about it uh, a couple of days ago. Lori and I have been aware of it. There's so much going on right now between uh, what the National Association of Realtors just agreed to with the Department of Justice, with what's going on with the rules, with what the legislature might do here in California, that more now than ever, uh, you need to pay attention and keep, keep your eyes peeled to the association's website uh, for information, not only on this topic, because again, a lot of issues are going to unfold over the next couple of months, specifying exactly what is and what is not uh, the extent of this hate speech restriction, um, but there's so much more. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to conclude my rant for today. Uh, I wish you all the luck in uh, that, that I possibly can, and uh, keep an eye on the association's website, because um, uh, they're going to provide you with the information that you need to keep yourself out of trouble and to help your clients uh, navigate these very difficult waters. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and uh, I bid you a good day. Mm -hmm.